Hey guys, this is Stobish with Radio Rothbard, and after this episode, we've got a special treat for you. Our guest today is Dr. Mark Thornton, and his Minor Issues podcast is one of my personal favorites. We're going to play his most recent episode, Where's the Beef, which gets a shout out in this episode in its entirety. Minor Issues is a great short podcast series dealing with real economic issues from an Austrian perspective, and also... A reminder that we have a free book giveaway going on right now. If you want a copy of Dr. Per Bylan's How to Think About the Economy, visit Mises.org slash RothPodFree. That's R-O-T-H-P-O-D free to get your free copy. Hey, guys, this is Tho Bishop with Radio Rothbard, and I want to let you guys know about another great Mises event we have coming up on November 4th in Fort Myers, Florida. As you know, everyday Americans feel the political capture of the economy. Inflation, taxes, and regulatory costs hit our paychecks and our savings. The regulatory capture of the medical industries, food and energy production, and the various instruments of big tech empower the regime with new tools to promote their latest ideological cause. The ever-growing burden of government debt has become a crisis without any political will to address it. We're going to be talking about these very issues at this event in Fort Myers. And best of all, we have a discount code for Radio Rothbard listeners. If you use promo code RR2023, RR as in Radio Rothbard, 2023, you'll get $10 off at this event. If you want to learn more, visit Mises.org slash FL2023. FL is in Florida. Look forward to seeing you there. Hello and welcome back to Radio Rothbard. I'm Ryan McMakin. I'm senior editor with the Mises Institute. And with me, of course, is my co-host, Tho Bishop. And we are welcoming also today, Mark Thornton. Mark is one of our senior fellows and also the creator of the Minor Issues podcast. And uh, this podcast, if you're interested in learning uh, Austrian economics in bite-sized pieces. These are shorter podcasts that uh, will keep you up to date on economic trends and the Austrian interpretations of them, which is to say the good sound economics that uh, we need to use to interpret these economic trends properly. And uh, you can learn a lot from that. I recommend it if you just have a few minutes and we're having him on here today because we want to expand a little bit on some of the trends uh, he's discussed on there. And one recent episode that caught my attention was just looking at uh, some of the commentary from economists on the current state of the economy. And I want to just really uh, start off by looking at Paul Krugman on this, because uh, we've seen many economists basically say that the economy is magnificent. And uh, don't worry about it. And we don't understand why anybody seems to think things are going badly. Uh, but let's look at what Krugman says. He's, uh, he's got this interview with the, uh, the always insufferable Christian Amanpour on CNN. And he uh, starts in with some commentary uh, on the state of the economy. And she asks him, right, there seems to be unease out there about the economy. And uh, he, he says, no, just completely untrue. And so here's the direct quote. The striking thing, if you look at it, it's not just, you know, the economic data have been surreally good. I mean, even optimists are just stunned by how quickly and how painlessly inflation has come down. You know, no hint of a recession, at least so far. Never know, but so far, inflation is not too far from the target of 2% and under 3% by most measures. And all of that just achieved painlessly, unquote. So let's just, <laughs> let's go straight to Mark on this. I, I mean, there's a lot that we could uh, point out is, uh, on many levels, the problem with this quote unquote analysis. Um, but Mark, what are we to make of a comment that says, really, we already solved the inflation problem painlessly. The economy is surreally good. Uh, and people just can't believe at how great things are, and it's time to move on, everything's fine, no recession, uh, onward and upward forever, my friends. Uh, when, you, when, you, when you see this, what is your initial reaction? Well, it's all spotlighting Krugman's take on the fact that price inflation, as measured by the Consumer Price Index, 
has come down from about 9% annual rate to less than 4% annual rate. But that's all price increases. So people are suffering from continued price increases. And Americans, the vast majority of them, are suffering economically uh, for the last several years, but certainly during this explosion of price inflation uh, in the economy. Real wages are down, prices are up, and Americans are noticing it, and they're having to make adjustments. And those are painful adjustments because they can't afford to continue to buy what they had previously been buying and paying for with their wages. And so they're having to make decisions. They're having to make cutbacks. They're having to trade down, buy down uh, to less desirable substitutes. Um, as I mentioned elsewhere, people's insurance bills for their homes and their cars are going out and their people are seeing uh, instead of 1% a year, they're seeing, or 2% a year, they're seeing double digit uh, increases in those bills so that uh, people are simply noticing the inflation because it's at such a high rate. Uh, even 4% is too high of a rate. Uh, it's reducing people's real income and it's forcing people to make choices. And in the last episode of the Minor Issues podcast, I focused in on the price of beef uh, because beef is a, an important standard part of the American diet. It's one of the most nutritious things people can consume. And it's a sign and symbol of attaining the middle class in America and being able to afford uh, high-end food products. And when Americans have been going into the grocery store, what they've been finding is that the price of beef is much higher than the actual average rate of inflation. They've had to substitute away into less desirable choices. They can see the scarcity of beef and its high price just by looking at the meat counter. There's just far fewer uh, choices of beef. Uh, the prices are much higher for those that exist. And there's a lot more substitutes uh, in there that are less desirable. And people are noticing for the first time for many people, you know, if, if price inflation goes up at 1% a year, it's not that big of a deal. They can't really tell how it's impacting them. But, you know, the fact that Americans have suffered for over two years of declining real in the sense of inflation-adjusted incomes um, is being felt, and people are mad. They're mad as hell. And Paul doesn't get it because he lives in, you know, swanky conditions. He makes uh, more than a million dollars a year. He probably doesn't pay his own bills or do his own shopping. So he's isolated like the rest of the power elites uh, with cozy positions, and they're just making excuses uh, for the people who pay them off. Yeah, and it's worth noting that this whole thing about how, oh, gee, we're almost back down to the 2% inflation goal, uh, which, first of all, uh, we're not. Uh, if, <laughs> in the most recent data, it was not only the largest increase in many months from month-to-month -month increases, that was 0.6% uh, percent up over that time period, which uh, was, was the largest since, oh, let's see, uh, early 2022, but it was up 3.7% in uh, year over year measure. Well, that's not, 3.7 isn't two. It's not pretty much the same thing. If it goes up just a, a little bit more, you're looking at double the target of 2%. But the 2% is this arbitrary number made up in the 1990s, where in the late 90s, Janet Yellen, who was then just a member of the Board of Governors, was saying, oh, yeah, well, we shouldn't have a goal of 0% inflation. We should have a goal of 2% inflation because they've created this idea that that somehow means the economy is growing better. And it, it, they literally believe they can conjure up something out of nothing by creating this wealth effect with 2% inflation rather than no inflation. And of course, 2% eats into your savings over time, especially if you're a normal person. You don't have huge assets earning large amounts of interest income. And that's, so 2% is bad enough, but they're saying, oh, the 2% is great. 
and I guess 3.7 percent of your Paul Krugman is fine too. Uh, it's only I guess inflation is only a problem if it was like eight, nine, ten percent is what their mindset seems to be probably for the reasons that you just listed in terms of what their standards of living are actually like in their relationship to money, which is totally different from a regular person who can't afford a steak anymore. They have to eat hamburger helper uh, instead if they wish to maintain the same budget. So a lot of the rhetoric is just nonsense in terms of the goalposts that they keep changing over time and telling us is good in terms of economic growth. So that's really uh, quite remarkable that uh, that's his point. And he's not the only one making it. If we look at uh, some other economists as well, there seems to have been a memo that went out in late 2022, which was we're all going to maintain uh, that the economy is fine. And last week on the Human Action Podcast, Bob Murphy and I, we looked at reactions among uh, some economists to that song, uh, Rich Men North of Richmond, and where the singer complains about uh, the cost of living, about inflation and taxes. And some economists felt the need to say, what well, is this guy complaining about? The economy is actually much better than you think it is. And most notable, uh, perhaps, was an article uh, by uh, Tyler Cowen, where he comes out and says, yeah, don't pay any attention to this song. Things are much better than, uh, than he thinks they are, than the singer thinks they are. Uh, things are better than, you, better than you think, dear American. And there's really no reason to put any stock in a song that complains about how hard life is. And uh, I, it just strikes me as odd that you would even write, that you'd even complain about such a song. That uh, that here's a person who I, I don't even know what's specific about the singer himself, but it's not hard to imagine that even when things are generally, quote unquote, good out there, there's going to be significant portions of the population that aren't doing equally well. And as I pointed out in that interview, we could look at state by state numbers in terms of GDP per capita growth. And there are huge differences ranging from like negative 17 percent up to positive 23 percent. So if you're in a place like West Virginia, your community is getting substantially poorer. And so people aren't supposed to complain then. They're just supposed to pretend that everything's fine for them. And I guess they should just move to Boston or something. And so the whole impulse is odd for an economist to get worked up about. But this, this article about the song follows up an earlier article that, that Cowan wrote, which he had given uh, the title of The Economy is Great, Stop Worrying About It, uh, and the, the, where he says pretty much the same thing as in the, uh, the article about the song. And then uh, we get something out of the, uh, the Harvard Gazette saying the economy keeps getting better and then outlines just how magnificent things are. So uh, my question for you, Mark, is that is... Do they have some ulterior motive here, or is this just their honest-to-goodness interpretation of the economic data? And they really just think things are fine, and they just can't imagine why anyone would think otherwise, or are they towing some kind of party line? Oh, they're definitely towing a party line. There's no question about it. Um, it's a good sign of the times, I think, that people ask me, where did they come up with this 2% inflation target after all? And I tell them that you know, 30 years ago, New Zealand's central bank got in trouble uh, because it was producing 10 percent double-digit inflation. And to reestablish their credibility with the people, they put out a guarantee that inflation would get back down below 3 percent and stay there. So they wanted to give confidence to the people, confidence to the economy, confidence in the central bank itself. Uh, so it's not really a positive goal to be achieved. It was only a, a, a goal of a central bank to establish its own or reestablish its own credibility. And the people in Washington, they, they do have a, an ulterior motive. They do um, work for other people, and, they, and, and the, their money comes indirectly from government in some form or fashion. So if you're a talking head um, or even an academic economist in the Washington, D.C. area, the value of your condominium goes up more per year than that poor young person in West Virginia makes in an entire year. So 
you know, setting the problems of inflation aside, there's a political class that hovers around the Washington, D.C. area that is doing very, very well um, as a result of government and the Fed and inflation and all the spending, all the deficits and all the debt that gets racked up. That all goes indirectly into their pockets. Uh, and it only, if ever, reaches the hinterlands of rural Alabama or re rural West Virginia. Um, it, the only way it reaches those people is through higher prices. So those are the people that are actually paying for all this largesse that is enjoyed by, you know, the journalist class, the academic economist class, the talking heads class, and everybody else that benefits from the political process that's fueled uh, by inflation and the Fed. And so you've noticed that the, the, the Fed guys are experts at pawning off <laughs> the reasons for inflation to other, other, like, just stuff they made up, right? Right. I mean, the Fed's top policy tool right now is basically gaslighting the, Amer the American people, right? They want to project confidence. They want people to make sure that, oh, there's, there's nothing going on here. The experts are in tr control. So, you know, they'll blame rising food prices on the Ukraine conflict, for example, which again, no doubt has an impact on wheat and a variety of things that do come from you know, Ukraine or Russia. And yet, if you look at underlying, you know, where's the pressure coming from food prices? It's places like beef, as Mark mentioned. It's orange juice, um, which is going through the roof right now, which we don't get a lot of oranges from Ukraine last time I checked. Um, olive oil is kind of leading massive thefts around the world right now. And it's not that every single aspect here is necessarily you know, tied to monetary policy. I know there's been some, some drought issues with, with olive oil, but their propaganda campaign predicates projecting confidence with the public that don't worry, we know what we're, you know, we, we are, we're in charge, we have the, the solutions to this. So you're seeing central banks, you know, manipulating data right now. We had an article by uh, Dr. Carl Friedrich Israel about changes Germany is making to their inflation index to make the inflation numbers look better than they are. And to Mark's point, you know, we're seeing a rising drumbeat for the need for the Fed to adopt a higher inflation target. You know, the Wall Street Journal a, f a few weeks ago, um, you had an economist, uh, Jason Furman. Um, you know, don't worry, he's, he's a... He's a big expert, right? He's a professor at Harvard, so you can trust his opinion. Um, but he's saying that the Fed should confidently project a 3% inflation target here in the United States, and that if the Fed could make up their 2% target rate all over again, they would, of course, pick something higher than 2%, because that's what we really need. And so again, you have kind of the expert class, you have this projected narrative that, hey, you know, ignore your lying eyes, you're, you're paying at the grocery store, is uh, just this is the price we pay for freedom. This is the price we pay for this great economy. And the, the experts know what they're doing. And thankfully, you know, when you have that sort of popular response, and I think this is why the, that song, you know, resonates so much, people aren't buying it anymore. And, you know, the question is, can the skepticism of central banks, can the skepticism of elites writ large drive to any meaningful pressure on, you know, reining in what the Fed does or, or getting, you know, reining in um, you know, the debt and regulatory state that is driving prices. No reason for confidence right now, given the leadership on the political board. Um, but, you know, people are far more aware of these underlying dynamics than they were when, you know, inflation rate or uh, interest rates made it very easy to st stack up cheap debt. These easy outs that policymakers have are uh, quickly dwindling by the wayside. So I'm glad I'm glad you brought up Ukraine, uh, because if you look at a lot of the data series, even the ones involving grain prices, which Ukraine produces a lot of grain, a lot of agricultural products, but all of those prices were rising fairly steeply before the situation in Ukraine officially broke out. And they went up steeply and then they came down uh, fairly steeply in most cases. And then the prices just started trickling higher and higher upwards from there. So there may have been a bump in a lot of the data series as a result of the outbreak of the Ukrainian situation, uh, but it certainly seems to disappear in the larger picture of things. And, you know, I, I just was thinking about Paul Krugman 
Paul Krugman has a, an absolute phobia, an absolute fear, and a lot of mainstream economists have this fear of deflation. They don't want to see prices falling. They don't want to see prices in general falling, uh, which means they don't want to see real wages of Americans increasing. And Paul Krugman has actually compared falling prices or deflation, uh, which is uncomfortably close to the 2% target or even a 3% target, but he's compared that to the U.S. economy entering a black hole where you get sucked in and you can never get out again. And of course, personally, I wouldn't mind being in a world where prices just continued to fall everywhere, always, forever. Um, but Paul Krugman and mainstream economists are absolutely opposed to that. And uh, they hate the idea of deflation that might actually benefit the American people. Uh, and they never really explain why. Um, and the reason why, the only rational reason why that I could pin to that phobia or that fear is that, of course, the government um, is on the hook now for $32 trillion and rising very rapidly. Um, and they've got to pay it back, which means we have to pay it back. Uh, and they just they don't want to see the value of the dollar falling because the whole premise of that monstrous national debt is that the Fed can always inflate it away, that we can always pay it back with cheaper dollars. And uh, that's the only rational reason, but they seem to be very irrational about this idea of low inflation or negative, de negative inflation or deflation, which would, uh, of course, benefit the average American. Well, of course, one of the scary things about this is that, you know, the need to project confidence when prices are rising as a result of government policies ends up fueling, you know, further totalitarian economic measures to combat these things. I mean, we've already seen it with uh, Justin Trudeau announcing, you know, threatening Canadian uh, grocery stores with, you know, if you don't get food prices under control, then we're going to come in and, you know, we're going to we're going to raise your taxes and we're going to force you to do this. We've seen Elizabeth Warren, um, you know, and the Bernie Sanders camp push inflation rates as a consequence of corporate greed. We've seen aggression from the Biden administration on trying to escalate um, various antitrust measures as another response. And so, you know, that's another dynamic here is that the consequences of inflation, the consequences of the regulatory costs, driving up prices, creating pressure on the public, lends itself to the government, you know, rather than dealing with the causes that they're creating, um, you know, imposing an even heavier hand. I mean, the inflation in the 70s led to price and wage controls, you know, during the Nixon administration. So we've seen this playbook happen before. You know, this, this kind of creates this doom loop of government intervention to solve the consequence of government intervention. And, you know, I think if we saw during COVID, for example, right, the infringement upon property rights with uh, renters and the like, the the stage is set for, you know, a, a renewal of, you know, some even more heavy handled, even more uh, egregious, even more radical expansions of government econ economic power responding to these very real price pressures out there. And what they want, of course, is the this, this soft landing narrative so that they can continue to push the idea that they've got everything under control and everything's fine. The problem I see from if they do achieve something that they would define as a soft landing is you just end up with then something like Japan where you've got you've got slow, long impoverishment. People continue to work long hours, but getting ahead continues to be very difficult, and it continues to be hard for regular people to make any sort of uh, interest income uh, and to move their wages up. And I, I think that's that's part of the reason why we as Austrians are interested in a real fix to the economy, not just something that these guys consider a fix. Because really, for them. The fix is just placate the public and get them to stop, uh, ex to, and get them to accept larger amounts of inflation and just think that's the only way forward. Make them fear recession more than they fear uh, inflation. Um, but by avoiding any sort of real inflation to the economy, all that means is that you're just growing up larger bubbles forever. And so I wanted to look a little bit at 
uh, just to, to finish your uh, other episode from a few weeks ago, uh, Mark, on minor issues where you say basically we need a crash landing where a soft landing is not going to actually improve things. And I think that's an important issue and also important to differentiate what our view of, of it is from this sociological view we're now getting from, say, some entrepreneurs and just some rich guys out there who clearly don't understand the boom-bust cycle. And this this caught up in the news where this was a recent thing where we had some billionaires saying, well, workers are lazy now and they're used to working from home. And so we need to teach them a lesson. We need to teach them who's boss by making unemployment go up and that will finally write the relationship between employers and employees and uh, we <laughs> we we need to somehow create a social change uh, to make people work harder and this this is weird to me right we there are economic explanations of why this has occurred and the, the imbalances in the job market and how really the the our current boom bust cycle has fostered that and so, Mark, I mean, how would all these weird issues where em employers are feeling like nobody wants to work for them, and then there's high inflation and all of that, uh, how does a crash landing actually really address some of these issues? Well, let's look at it this way. Do you want the Fed in charge being the pilot of the plane uh, that's going to somehow cure the economy? Or would you rather have it based on economic rationality of where we stand right now and where we have to go to get better off? You know, the Fed is telling us the story, this Goldilocks story that we don't want too little policy, we don't want too much policy, we want everything to turn out right. But the Fed is a pilot of the economy that's looking backwards. You know, they even admit that they're data dependent. So they're looking at what is happening in the past and then making judgments about the present and the future. Uh, and of course, they're not doing it with their own money. And they're giving us a very heavy dose of propaganda about how wonderful things are and how you should not be fearful of your investments and your money and the value of the dollar and all these things. But let's just look at where government has gotten us in some very broad general categories, like housing. Uh, housing right now is more unaffordable, the price relative to our incomes, than it's ever been in history. Okay, so housing is now less affordable than ever before. Houses are relatively scarce on the market because of the, the government managing the, the mortgage market and the Fed setting interest rates. So they've totally screwed up our housing market. Uh, energy is likewise screwed up. We're headlong into all of this uh, solar energy and so forth. Uh, and yet energy prices are once again on the march higher. And this is despite uh, the Biden administration draining the strategic petroleum reserve during that march towards higher prices. So they're not helping uh, in any way in terms of housing and energy. They're actually screwing things up. And then you, you mentioned the job market where we have too many job openings. Uh, not enough workers, real incomes declining, uh, people not being able to pay back their student loans because their jobs uh, can't handle those kind of uh, obligations. Um, and we're at the same time giving out zillions of dollars to keep people on public assistance or welfare, disability and so forth. Uh, and so you know, the government is pushing on the labor market in all sorts of directions, and it's coming out badly uh, in every case. So they've screwed up housing, they've screwed up energy, they've screwed up the job market. Uh, what kind of confidence do you have in the Federal Reserve somehow mag magically bringing the economy down into a soft landing without any pain when, in fact, 
they're already dishing out the pain to the American people in large doses, and they're making us swallow it with a heavy dose of broad-based propaganda and a confidence game in their own ability, which is obviously untrue. So we're being currently misled by the Fed, and we're supposed to believe in everything that they say and do. Um, and in reality, what we want is an economy that's a functioning on a free price system where it's absorbing the unfortunate boom uh, of COVID and the previous boom um, in all of our asset markets. And uh, we need to, you know, to deal with those things. And the way we deal with them is to use the price system to figure out where we need to go next, whether that's capital, whether that's labor, where entrepreneurs should go next. Um, and so I talk about that in that episode of the Minor Issues prod podcast, and I refer back to some of the articles that I wrote in late uh, 2022 about exactly how Austrians view this whole process and how we can get the economy back on track of solid economic growth and better jobs. All right. Well, we'll link to all of those in the description and we'll feature some of them uh, also in our Power and Market uh, feature on Mises.org uh, this week. And so we'll go ahead and wrap up this episode with Radio Rothbard with that. Thank you, Mark, for coming on and uh, guesting this week. And we'll have you back again in another month or so just to uh, see what, uh, what new news we can cover then as well and what the, the latest economic trends are. And so thank you all out there for listening to Radio Rothbard. We'll be back next week with another episode. We'll see you next time. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Minor Issues Podcast. I'm Mark Thornton at the Mises Institute. Today's episode looks at the question, where's the beef? You remember the famous Wendy's ad, where's the beef? It was a successful product recognition advertisement that promoted the beef content of Wendy's hamburgers while simultaneously suggesting that their competitors were skimping on the beef content of their own hamburger. In today's economy, people are asking, where's the beef in a different sense? If things are so good in the American economy in terms of GDP and unemployment and falling inflation, high stock markets, then why are Americans seeing a big economic problem in the U.S. economy, particularly with inflation? Americans do see a problem. And if you don't, you better take another look. Only one third approve of Biden's handling of the economy. 51% think that things are actually getting worse. And most people say that wages are simply not keeping up with inflation. In fact, they use the words like struggling 61% of the time, uncertain 56% of the time, unfair 36, punishing 27%, and an economy rebounding only 15%. A recent Suffolk University poll found the same thing. Americans do not approve of the Democrats or the Republicans handling of the economy and are mad about the Fed's inflation, which is upsetting their lives, forcing them to do without, and necessitating that they trade down to less desirable choices. Now, on the other hand, Paul Krugman, the famous Keynesian economist who loves the taste of his own feet, says things are surreally good, that there is no hint of recession, that the Fed is not too far off of its targets, things are great, it's really Goldilocks conditions where everything is just right. Krugman himself chalks up this disconnect as a result of partisanship in American politics and basic American stupidity in the population. Of course, Paul is a multimillionaire living in Manhattan, and I would be shocked if he oversaw grocery shopping in his household or paying his own bills. I'm going to explain where the beef is. 
the price of ground beef from 1985 to 2000 was about $1.50 a pound. Now it's over $5 a pound. That's a 250% increase. Bacon in the earlier period averaged around $2.50 a pound. Now it's well over $6.50 a pound, a 165% increase. Now, in that earlier period, the consumer price index was up 70%, and it's been up since 2000, another 70% till COVID hit. And then we've gotten probably 15 to 25% price inflation since then. That's not nearly as bad as beef and bacon prices, but that's only because of all the tech-oriented goods and services where prices have risen slower or even decreased. But those things are the result of the free market, not the Fed. From World War II to 1975, when we were on the gold standard, beef consumption in America per capita doubled. And then since the fiat dollar of 1971 was put in place, beef consumption has gone down by over a third per capita. We strongly suspect that consumption has fallen sharply in the last couple of years since COVID was introduced due to the much higher prices and even how little is on display in the shrinking meat counter in your local grocery store. So it's more chicken for everyone just like the Chick-fil-A ad says. And by the way, Mongolians eat 100 times more goat meat than Americans. Beef consumption in many countries is tied to wealth and well-being, particularly of the middle class, which has had to resort to more chicken and pork because of higher prices. And who knows, maybe some more goat meat. One product does not make for a proper gauge of the overall Fed inflation on prices, but it does explain the anger of people because it's coming fast and forcing people to make really hard decisions of what not to buy. And other prices, home and auto insurance also took a sharp increase recently. Housing prices are now less affordable today than ever in history. Utility rates and bills are up noticeably, and I think the reprieve in energy prices has now come to an end. Think of it this way. If price inflation is low and slow, the frog in a pot of hot water will supposedly not notice and die a slow death. But if inflation is hot and fast, that same frog will poop in your pot and jump to safety. Unfortunately, most people have nowhere to jump to and are mad as hell about it. Do you understand now, Paul? 